Hi, I'm Reverend Paul Ashby, and I invite you to join us as we seek to follow the compassionate heart of Jesus in our world today. Hi, my name is Stacy Schulmerich. I'm the Director of Faith Formation to Children, Youth, and Families. Hi, I'm Susan. Hi, I'm Anthony. I'm Katie Scoble, and we are your music team. I'm Dan Thompson, Chair of the Worship Board. We're glad you're with us today. Though our building remains closed, the heart of our church is very much open. Please visit our website to learn more about RBCC and join us for a post-worship coffee hour. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Welcome to our community. Oh, hey church, it's Katie. We, this week, are going to do a retrospective of some of the musical pieces that were most loved over the past couple of months. We try very hard to make a cohesive experience of a worship service with our music supporting the scripture and the sermon and the word. So Stacy and Paul and the worship board and I work all together to make sure that these things happen. But your feedback is most desired. So feel free again to email me at katie at rbccucc.org and let me know what you like the most. And we'll be sprinkling in some of those favorites over the next few weeks as well, and maybe even over summer, depending on how things go. So stay safe, stay healthy, let me know what you love, and please enjoy the music for this week's service. Let's do something out of the ordinary today. Let's try something that most churches would never dare to try. Let's drop all conformity, all uniformity, all arm twists to follow some creed like robots. I want you to try something that churches don't do. And that is, 
Thank God for the capacity to doubt. Yes, feel gratitude for doubts that can lead us to spiritual exploration. Be joyful that we are not robots mimicking the same programmed creed. I thank God for doubt in this time when those without doubts storm a capital based on false beliefs. Doubts can save you. Doubts can save you and family members from joining and associating with things like the Klan, the Proud Boys, ISIS, military groups that are out in survival mode shooting guns and preparing for the end of the world. Thank God for the doubts and doubters in our society. We certainly need more of them. Amen. Hi, church. Welcome to our Easter season. Our theme for these next seven weeks is Dare to Dance Again. That theme is one that will address the fact that many of us have felt stuck, stuck in our homes, in situations, in, in our bodies, perhaps. Daring to dance again reminds us that we are called to move for freedom and to do it for all the world to see, especially perhaps in times of great difficulty. So this idea extends to our new Threshold song, and we will sing about dances of hope, dances of justice, dances of love. So let me teach it to you. Here's your opening pitch. You might want to sing down here. I'll be singing up here. I'll sing, then you repeat after me. Dare to dance with dreamers, sing their song. Dare to dance with dreamers, sing their song. Dare to dance their stories, sing out strong. Dare to dance their stories, sing out strong. Dare to dance with freedom your whole life long. Dare to dance with freedom your whole life long. Dare to dance again. Dare to dance again. Now that last one I stylized a little bit. Let's go over the final phrase one more time. Dare to dance again. And you. Dare to dance again. All right, let's sing this whole thing together with the accompaniment. everybody and welcome to Eastertide. Eastertide is the season after Easter and it's not just one day, it's a whole 50 days, seven weeks, one more than Lent. But it is a time of seven weeks of growing in our Christ likeness that carries us all the way to Pentecost, the day that we celebrate the formation of the Christian church community and reflect that Christ likeness into the world. And this season of Eastertide is much more than just a happy springtime season. It's actually rather a, a fierce and revolutionary time of storytelling that shapes our identity as Christians and shapes our participation in God's mission in the world, a mission of hope and of justice and of love. 
And so I open today with this opening prayer. Resurrected God, though we have hidden ourselves in locked rooms and huddled together as ones who build barriers, send to us your living word through our locked doors and into our guarded hearts that we might witness your grace and be couriers of your goodness. Through your Holy Spirit, grant us the trust to believe the good news of your resurrection, not because we have seen it ourselves, but because we have been seen by it and transformed because of it. Teach us to rejoice in the power of Easter following Jesus in a life resurrected. Teach us to act with compassion and justice. Teach us to dance with the beat of your heart, God, in hope and in justice and in love. Amen. For intergenerational time today, I have a question for you. Do you have a pair of dancing shoes? I do. These are my stage shoes. I've worn them lots in RVCC Players Productions where I often would dance and I loved to choreograph. But growing up in the church as a teen and as a young adult, I often shared my spirit by interpreting scripture through movement. I danced in church as an expression of my faith. And so I brought these dancing shoes today because I want to talk about a very common dance we do in our spiritual growth 
And that is the dance of doubt and faith. For many people, faith is the opposite of doubt. And sometimes we try to just eliminate doubt altogether, get rid of it, because then we have faith, right? But as it turns out, faith and doubt are not opposites. In fact, they make really excellent dance partners. In fact, each one takes the lead at one time or another. And so today in the story of Doubting Thomas, and really I would like to just change his name if you would allow me to, because it's so negative when we think about doubting, even though doubts are so good. I guess I would call him Curious Thomas, because after all, Curious Thomas was only doing what he was taught to by Jesus, his teacher, who was of the Jewish tradition, and that was question everything. Curious Thomas was asking to see Jesus's wounds, to touch his physical presence, to ask the questions of his faith. How is this happening? Thomas was just seeking a little reassurance, just a little confirmation. The disciples were entering the ministry Jesus had started, but now they had to go out and do it without him by their side. Doubts. And the disciples were going to go into the world and confirm God's presence and God's justice and love in the world. And they were trusting that Jesus had prepared them very well to do this. Faith. So Jesus calls each of us to be super curious in our faith. Faith asks a lot of questions. Have a faith that isn't afraid to be led by doubts. A faith that does not live behind or dance behind closed doors. So all my curious Thomases out there, I ask you, what confirms God in the world for you? A song, a feeling, words, images, relationships? And what confirms God within you to you? What questions or feelings or talents or intuitions or, or wisdom do you contain that points to God? Be curious. That is the dance of your Easter tide. So go do the curious dance of doubt and faith. Amen. In terms of joys and concerns this week, it is a great joy to hear from church members who are taking advantage of the new wide open appointment system, who already have an appointment for April 16th, and congratulations. So please uh, get on the computer, sign up, and be a part of the next wave of people who receive their vaccination. We're thankful for this opportunity for those of us who haven't hit the right age groupings yet, peace, shalom, salam. In other joys, it's a great joy that the present administration is working to vastly expand wind power, particularly on the East Coast, to deal with climate change. Let's honor this significant change in national policy that cares and is concerned about our future and the environment. Peace, shalom, salam. In concerns, we pray for transgendered youth who are being targeted by laws to, to restrict their sports participation in the state of South Dakota and to restrict medical treatments in Arkansas. We pray for both fairness and understanding to grow throughout our country and all of its states. Peace, shalom, Salam. We also pray for churches in Indonesia who continue to receive bomb threats after one church was faced with a bombing on Palm Sunday. And we just pray for them in this time when they are striving to do interfaith peace work in this time of tension. Peace. Shalom. Salam. We pray for a friend of the church, Mike, who received some difficult news about um, his own ongoing treatment 
and Mike, who's a, who's a friend of the church, is now on hospice, and uh, we just pray for him in this time when he is coming home and just facing the difficult final chapter. Peace. Shalom. Salam. Let us enter into prayer together. Holy One, we're thankful for the gifts of reason, intelligence, and reflection. We dare to thank you for the capacity to doubt. We joyfully embrace the gift of a good question. We're grateful for the many gifts of doubt, to see past fables and untrue tweets, to question political propaganda, to examine the evidence, to move past rigid fundamentalist thinking that places rules above what is reasonable and helpful. We thank you for all the doubts about naive Christian views that often blind us to the reality of the teachings of Jesus. Help us to see past the foolishness and limitations of our own cultural blinders. Help us to see the truth and to follow the path of truth where your spirit leads us. This we ask as we follow in the steps of Jesus who taught us to pray by saying, Holy God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God for all that love has done. Creator Christ and Holy There's a river flowing in my heart. There's a river flowing in my heart. And it's telling me I am somebody. There's a river flowing in my heart.
The sermon scripture for today is the famous passage about Thomas in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. It reads as follows. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of persecution, Jesus came, stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced when they recognized the Lord. And Jesus said again, Peace be with you. As God has sent me, he said, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed upon them and said, Receive God's Spirit. If you forgive any sin, they are forgiven. If you retain any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus appeared. So when the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, he replied, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands, and unless I put my finger in the mark where his nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were joined in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Thomas said, Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach your hand out. Touch my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord, my God. And Jesus said, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. May the wisdom of this story resonate in our hearts. Only three disciples had legendary nicknames. According to tradition, John was called the beloved disciple and said to be the author of First John that proclaims simply, God is love. Simon was nicknamed Peter or Petros, meaning the rock. Thomas, well, Thomas he got stuck with the most infamous nickname. His nickname actually became a part of his name for many Christians. We know Thomas as Doubting Thomas, as if his first name was the name Doubting. I think that's completely unfair to Thomas. He was stuck with a nickname for something you and I would have done. Wouldn't we have asked the disciples for some actual evidence of the Easter event? Be honest. Wouldn't you want proof? I'm just asking. Consider the setting. First, Sunday night on the day of Easter. The disciples are huddled together in a locked room, afraid hiding out in fear of persecution. 
They know Jesus died on Friday. And they weren't going to show their faces in public. They didn't want to risk death, particularly a gruesome, tortured death as an enemy of the empire. Jesus was dead. Their hopes and dreams to bring about the realm of God's compassion had ended. The bad guys had won. The mission had failed. It was all over. It's time to stay underground, not make any waves, retreat. Then on Sunday night in John's version of the resurrection, this shocking thing happened. Jesus appears to his disciples who are where? Locked behind closed doors. And the story doesn't mention Jesus knocking or anyone opening the door. Jesus appears to them, blesses them. They didn't quite recognize him until he speaks. And then he shows his hands with the nail marks and his side where the spear had ripped through him on Friday. Obviously, this was not a bleeding, bandaged, physical being coming for medical care. Now, Thomas missed this event. So when the other disciples say, we've seen Jesus, and seen him in a very different manner from what they had experienced in his earthly life, well, Thomas, hmm, Thomas had a few questions. Wouldn't you? If we're honest, we admit that we would have questions. I would look at them and say, first, what have you guys been drinking or smoking? Are you kidding me? Is, is this some type of joke? Yes, we would have our doubts. We would have our questions. I find Thomas's response both reasonable and restrained. He wanted the facts, not conjecture. He simply replies, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Isn't that simply a normal expectation of evidence? And for this, he stuck with the nickname for all of world history, at least, of being Doubting Thomas. A week passes. Jesus appears again to Thomas. And this time, before touching Jesus, just the appearance, the presence, causes him to say, my Lord and my God. So how did Thomas change? From this honest skeptic who wouldn't believe without evidence, Thomas becomes the apostle, the missionary to the nation of India. He founded the churches in India. And if you visit India today, you can meet hundreds of thousands of people who describe themselves as Thomas Christians. Not doubting Thomas Christians. It's said that he died in India as a martyr for his faith. And in India, Thomas is visualized and valued and appreciated as one of the great saints and apostles of Jesus. History has been way, way too hard on Thomas. Churches have been much too harsh on those who doubt. Sometimes I think our Bible study group could be called a doubter's group because we raise questions that we struggle with and reflect on from week to week. But there's great energy in honest doubt. Doubts can give us the courage to go beyond secondhand reports. Doubts can invite us to raise the hard questions, the big questions of life and death. Doubt inspires the search for greater understanding and meaning. Doubt opens the door to new evidence. Doubt creates a space for new scientific breakthroughs. Doubts can lead us on a path of spiritual discovery. Let us praise the power of doubt to object to superstition, to move us past the confines of fundamentalism, 
to ignore the forces in culture that want uniformity, conformity, and dislike diversity and creativity. Doubt asks, what's really essential in life? Doubt inspired our spiritual ancestors to question when biblical texts were used to justify slavery, racism, and homophobia, the UCC and its congregational ancestors said, we doubt it. In our United Church of Christ tradition, we have a history of doubting and enjoying the gifts of honest doubts. I hold to the wisdom of Albert Einstein, who claimed a good question reveals more than a good answer. So when people come to me and tell me about their doubts, I say, congratulations, you're really in the right church. Now, I do have to say that some types of doubt are unhelpful, particularly in counseling situations. If doubts leave us hanging when we need to take action to improve something in our life, that's not a good doubt. If doubts create unfinished business that we suppress, that is unhealthy doubt. Doubt can also erode a sense of trust that's necessary for every family and every organization. Doubts can make us feel more isolated from others and even alienated from God. So there's some negative, unhelpful doubts that are part of many counseling experiences. But for most people, doubt provides a great tool to clear away dogma, to question propaganda. You see, January 6, with the insurrection at the nation's capital, happened because people failed to doubt the propaganda, the lies, and the tweets. We need to see through the layers of lies within culture and society. When Trump lied about the elections being stolen, were you not a doubting Thomas? Some 59 courts doubted Donald Trump's claims and propaganda. Were they not doubting Thomases? A doubting Thomas does not mentally believe things that are illogical, unreasonable, lacking in evidence. I have a confession to make. I am a doubting Thomas. And yes, I think there's probably a little doubting Thomas in you, or you wouldn't have found the evolution in your own spiritual journey to be a part of the United Church of Christ. But I'm also a person of faith who's committed to following Jesus and to do so in my own imperfect way, as we all do it in our own imperfect, clumsy manners, hoping for the grace of God to guide us. I have faith in Jesus' path of compassion. Yes, a doubting Thomas can still be a person of faith. When I think of one of the greatest people of faith in the last 100 years, it's Mother Teresa, and I love her diary because you can read her reflections upon doubt, upon worry, upon anxiety, upon whether God is there. And yet, she had the courage each day to get up, to show up, to do the best she could to fulfill her mission of compassion. Day after day after day, even when she had doubts, even when she had fears, even when she was discouraged, even if she wondered if God was there, she knew she was there and that she had a calling to fulfill. To me, the most important book to understand the last five years is really a book about American history. It's a book entitled Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire by Kurt Anderson. Or if you don't want to read an entire book, just type in Kurt Anderson with a K into your YouTube and listen to a couple of his insightful reflections on that book. It traces the history of fantasies and fables in American history and how 
So many people have fallen for fantasies and fables and odd political groups. People who have no doubts are the most dangerous people on earth. People with no doubts start wars without exit strategies. They will also join up with groups like Proud Boys or ISIS. They will attack those they view as subhuman or heretical. Doubt gives you the power to question, to look beyond the propaganda. Doubt can purify the thought process with a heavy dose of simple facts. Doubt reminds us there are things also that we're never going to understand. Doubt points us beyond the concepts of theology that we admit no one, no one has a monopoly on God. Doubt helps us to make peace with the mysteries beyond the limits of our finitude. Doubt adds a level of honesty to faith. When dogmatic people claim they have one way to God and ask me, how can you live with doubt? I usually turn and ask, how can you live on planet Earth without some doubts? Amen.
make you to shine like the sun and hold you in the palm of his hand and hold you, hold you in the palm of his hand. I offer everyone today this closing prayer before you go out to dance with doubt and faith in the world. Though our questions may sometimes overwhelm us and our doubts stridently speak loud, we praise you, God, for the gift of faith. Though we may miss the signs of life and ignore the little resurrections all around us, we praise you, Divine Spirit, for the gift of faith. Though we may constantly seek proof and refuse to believe without seeing with our own eyes, we praise you, curious one, for the gift of faith. Thank you, great mystery, for your life that transcends our understanding, for your presence, which we can never flee from, for your resurrection, which is never, ever defeated, and for the gift of faith that enables us to trust and to live by curious seeking, even in the midst of our doubts and fears. Amen. Have a great week. See